Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Greg Wheeler. I'm uh, the chair of the uh, Peter Mac Paediatric and Late Effects Clinical Service, and I'm chairing this morning's session. So welcome to day two of the National Particle Symposium. We're very glad to have you all here, and I hope that you've all uh, recovered and refreshed from yesterday afternoon's amazing presentations. I must admit some of it was above my head, but it was uh, very enjoyable anyway. Uh, we've got some really amazing uh, talks and guests today with a more of a clinical bent than yesterday afternoon. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to again acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which each of us are joining from and to honour their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, for us here at Peter Mac, we'd like to acknowledge the people of the Wundjeri, uh, the Wundjeri people who've been custodian of the lands uh, for thousands of years. To start the day, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce uh, Dr Tom Merchant, who is the Director of Radiation Oncology at the St Jude Children's uh, Hospital in Memphis, which is the biggest paediatric oncology uh, service in the States. I was privileged to do a fellowship there uh, with Tom uh, many years ago, more years than either of us are prepared to accept. Um, Tom's also been the chair of the uh, radiation oncology uh, specialty group of the children's oncology group for um, for many years and stepped down from that role a couple of years ago. His research output has been phenomenal. His RT1 series on localised brain tumours is the biggest single institution uh, series of paediatric radiation ever published. Uh, and the data that he generated from that study continues to be published almost on a monthly basis. Uh, he's also been the radiation oncology lead for the St Jude Medalloblastoma uh, studies, uh, which started in 1996. We're now up to St Jude 12, which is about to close. Um, and the data from that has driven a lot of important research, uh, uh, important findings and treatment uh, strategies uh, for medulloblastoma over the years. Uh, Tom has done an incredible amount of work in looking at the side effects of radiation, and I think he's uniquely poised to discuss with us the role of protons. Uh, the Memphis Proton Centre was open a few years ago. Uh, and we do have plenty of time after Tom's uh, presentation for him to take questions. He's uh, sitting in Memphis uh, from Thursday afternoon for us uh, and will be joining us after the presentation to answer questions. So please feel free to type your questions and we will ask them and allow plenty of time for discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Tom, please. Thank you for allowing me to speak about pediatric cancers and proton therapy. My name is Thomas E. Merchant. I'm a pediatric radiation oncologist and chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. I practice as a board certified radiation oncologist for more than 25 years with a focus on the treatment of childhood tumors. Radiation therapy continues to play an important role in children with all types of tumors. Its role appears to have been strengthened by the results of recent clinical trials. For children, it's understood that when local control depends on the use of radiation therapy, alternative strategies and radiotherapy avoidance result in inferior outcomes. In my talk today, I'd like to give you an overview of the role and use of proton therapy in pediatric oncology and focus on brain and solid tumors. I would also like to present our initiatives to study uncertainties associated with proton therapy using umbrella protocols that enroll eligible patients. With the advent of proton therapy and the convergence of advanced planning methods, image guidance, and our improved understanding of radiation dose and treatment effects, we've identified new indications for proton therapy and opportunities for advancement. There are numerous publications that provide evidence of increasing utilization of proton therapy for children with cancer. There are also numerous examples that show the equivalence of proton therapy to photon therapy in terms of local tumor control. And many of the pediatric talks at the recent ASTRO meeting were focused on the disease control equivalents. The ability of proton therapy to spare normal tissues is unquestioned, and there's emerging evidence to suggest that it improves functional outcomes. Demonstrating a benefit of proton therapy in children with cancer requires long-term follow-up and is impacted by a relatively small number of patients, diverse disease presentations and treatment regimens, and a multitude of endpoints that might be considered. When treating children, minimizing side effects is a common goal. During the past 25 years, we've investigated target volume reduction in the context of prospective clinical trials for pediatric brain and solid tumors 
and even Hodgkin lymphoma. The results of these trials show that the target volume could be safely reduced without affecting the rate or patterns of failure. These trials also allowed us to study the side effects of radiation therapy and show that radiation therapy could be safely administered to very young children with brain tumors, reducing the risk of neurologic, endocrine, and cognitive effects. When we reached a plateau in our ability to spare normal tissues, the advent of proton therapy created an opportunity to continue with our original goals. Comparative planning studies led to prospective clinical trials that hope to yield tangible results and validate the resources and expense required to support proton therapy. Our experience with photon therapy became a rich source of data and produced models of radiation effect that suggested proton therapy would be the next logical step to improve outcomes for our patients. More than 10 years ago, we did the research and acquired the tools to model potential outcomes for patients treated with proton therapy. Pediatric brain tumors are uniquely characterized by the propensity to seed the neuraxis requiring craniospinal irradiation. Proton craniospinal irradiation is the most striking and promising example of the advantage of proton therapy. Although extra CNS complications of photon craniospinal irradiation are limited for most patients, we believe the reduction in cataract formation, primary hypothyroidism, thyroid nodules and cancer, and craniofacial problems will be substantial. We are further hopeful that proton therapy can be used to limit problems related to spinal growth and development, underappreciated intra-abdominal complications, and secondary tumors. Metulloblastoma is the most common malignant brain tumor in children. In current clinical trials, these patients are now divided into several groups and subgroups for which radiation therapy regimens have been specifically designed. These patients may now be treated on radiation therapy regimens based on clinical, pathologic, and molecular features. In our current SJMB12 trial, there are eight different therapeutic regimens, including three different craniospinal and primary site dose regimens. More than 20 sites have participated in this trial since 2013, including several in Australia. Using proton therapy, we now limit the dose to the hypothalamic pituitary axis, cochlea, and supratentorial brain to the prescribed craniospinal dose, and for portions of the spine, reduce the dose to below the threshold levels associated with impaired final height. Here, we compare patients treated with 15 gray and 23.4 gray craniospinal irradiation using protons and photons. The reduction in mean dose to the brain has been substantial. The treatment of ependymoma has changed considerably. This is one of the leading tumors treated using proton therapy. We now have more than 20 years of experience using immediate postoperative irradiation in children as young as 12 months of age. Sparing normal tissues is on the mind of every parent and caregiver. Investigators worldwide have adopted frontline radiation therapy for very young children with this tumor based on the promise of advanced methods, including proton therapy. There is still much work to be done. As radiation oncologists, it's important that we settle on the appropriate dose and volume for these patients, especially those with infratentorial tumors. We also need to consider ways to further improve the treatment of these patients, including normal tissue dose reduction, and take full advantage of pencil beam scanning proton therapy. The role of proton therapy has been strengthened by advances in targeting, the precision of treatment delivery, and normal tissue sparing. Newer proton methods allow treatments to be tailored to individual patients. Our ability to conform our treatments to the volume at risk and spare critical normal tissue structures has never been greater and has created new opportunities including re-irradiation for patients with ependymoma recurrent after prior therapy. Craniopharyngioma is a unique supracellular tumor that affects children of all ages. We're currently researching the role of proton therapy to improve cognitive outcomes in children with craniopharyngioma. The central location of this tumor means that children diagnosed with this locally aggressive tumor often have pre-existing deficits. We will soon report on clinical trials that include more than 200 children with this diagnosis and hope to show the benefit of proton therapy. We know there is a significant difference comparing photon and proton therapy in terms of dose to normal tissues. The question is whether this difference is clinically significant. Our data suggests an improvement in the cognitive measures of academic achievement, specifically reading and math, comparing proton patients to those treated in the past with photon therapy. 
We are hopeful that these results will be maintained long-term in this vulnerable group of patients. CNS germ cell tumors are rare brain tumors of great interest to many in the field of pediatric oncology. They require multimodality care with surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. They respond remarkably to treatment and may be thoroughly evaluated using neuroimaging and markers in serum and CSF. Questions about the use of radiation therapy, in particular radiation dose and volume, are primary aims in most trials. Radiation oncologists enjoy treating these patients and the challenges associated with targeting the ventricles and primary site. Proton therapy is uniquely suited for germ cell tumor target volumes. When treatment of non-germinomous germ cell tumor in the children's oncology group included six cycles of induction chemotherapy, followed by high-dose craniospinal irradiation to 36 gray, and boost treatment of the primary site to 54 gray, the five-year event-free survival was 90%. When the treatment was modified to emit craniospinal irradiation, the results were inferior with a five-year progression-free survival less than 80%. Spinal failure as a component of failure was most common. Children's Oncology Group investigators have now proposed to bring back spinal irradiation, albeit at a lower dose of 30 gray, and match it to the whole ventricle and primary site treatment volumes used in the earlier trial. This unique treatment proposal will be feasible uh, for such complex geometry and safe when combined with the most advanced proton methods. An excellent example of technology advancement using proton therapy can be found in our new trial for patients with low-grade glioma. After we determined there was a relationship between the irradiated volume of the hippocampus and specific psychology test scores, our group launched a multicenter clinical trial that uses hippocampal sparing proton therapy for selected patients with low-grade glioma. Indeed, the future looks bright for the use of proton therapy to complement clinical trials with tailored treatment regimens that stratify patients according to well-understood clinical factors and evolving molecular biomarkers. The benefit of proton therapy is not limited to brain tumors. For rhabdomyosarcoma, we found opportunities to lower radiation doses for tumors that responded to treatment or those reclassified as lower risk after planned second surgery. For these patients, we've lowered the radiation dose from 50.4 gray to 36 gray and used proton therapy to spare normal tissues. Using proton therapy, we've undertaken dose escalation to treat tumors with a higher rate of local failure. We now administer 59.4 gray to patients with large tumors at presentation. Early evidence suggests local control rates may be improving. Proton therapy also makes combined modality therapy easier. Understanding that rhabdomyosarcoma may arise in a variety of vulnerable body sites, limiting dose to normal tissues and interactions between radiation and chemotherapy can have a profound impact on quality of life. In searching for ways to improve outcomes using proton therapy, one would not think a Wilms tumor or renal tumor as an obvious candidate. The current method of flank irradiation is foolproof and has been used for decades. Considering the high rate of survivorship and risk of long-term complications involving the interabdominal organs, our group is exploring the possibility of using proton therapy to limit treatment to the retroperitoneum and spare normal tissues. Given the paucity of data on the acute and late toxicity of proton therapy in pediatric patients, we developed a Phase four prospective trial, St. Jude Proton I, open to all St. Jude patients treated with proton therapy. We custom design toxicity assessments that are completed by clinical staff. The assessments are exported in a dynamic fashion to evaluate the incidence of non-hematologic proton therapy grade three to five adverse events. Proton therapy associated toxicities undergo a rigorous process of attribution to determine if the toxicity is a product of single or multiple modalities. This trial provides a framework for future analyses studying the relationship between dosimetric parameters and proton-related toxicity. The early results from this trial were recently presented at this year's ASTRO meeting. The curves on the left show the enrollments by treatment site and the rates of grade three and above toxicity. At this point, the rates of hospitalization and proton-related morbidity appear to match those reported in the photon literature. The plot on the right uh, shows no excess risk of local failures and acceptable marginal failure incidence in both CNS and non-CNS tumor cases. 
Daily patient positioning throughout treatment is critical to precise tumor targeting and normal tissue sparing in children. There are many normal tissues to consider in children, each with unique dose-response relationships and potential complication risks. Only 16 of 31 U.S. proton centers have in-room 3D tomographic image capability. Many centers rely on 2D x-ray bony anatomy. Since our first treatment in 2015, Cone Beam CT has been utilized daily for every patient. Before beam delivery, patient position is compared against the planned position. Correction is made subsequently to achieve acceptable accuracy. We developed a clinical trial, CNG Proton 2, to establish a repository of imaging data acquired during the proton therapy course to link with treatment planning and clinical information for pediatric patients with all types of cancer. We hope to estimate distributions of patient setup uncertainty measured with daily pretreatment comb beam CT and to compare patient setup corrections using both 2D planar and 3D volumetric imaging systems. This study includes secondary and exploratory aims and will identify clinical and treatment factors that contribute to setup uncertainty and interfractional movement. Eligibility includes any patient who will receive more than five treatment fractions. The protocol will be open for approximately five years and will enroll head and body cohorts. In our department, we're also developing a protocol to study changes in tumor and normal tissues using on-treatment MR imaging. We feel that it's important to evaluate on-treatment imaging for all patients, not only those enrolled on protocols for specific diseases. We hope to understand better the frequency and extent of imaging required during treatment of our patients. This slide shows for a variety of cases, changes in tissue heterogeneity, target volume shift, and target volume shrinkage that may impact target and normal tissue dosimetry using proton therapy. Our protocol proposal includes several strata. A high-risk strata will represent patients who need to be imaged frequently because they're at risk for a change in plan quality during treatment. A lower-risk strata will represent patients who need to be imaged less often because they're at low risk for a change in plan quality during treatment. Criteria currently being developed to trigger replanning. It's important for the entire department to be on board with replanning requirements. We still have much to learn about the use of proton therapy. It's difficult to imagine that proton therapy is not better for our patients, even when compared to the most advanced photon methods. How could it not be better if we are irradiating less normal tissue? In a short period of time, proton therapy became the treatment of choice for patients at our center. Within the first year of opening our center, the number of treatments using proton therapy exceeded those using photon therapy. We treated our first patient uh, at our proton therapy center in late 2015. Prior to that time, we financially supported the referral of protocol eligible patients for treatment at outside facilities. When our center opened, we were able to continue treatment of patients on active studies that either allowed proton therapy or included proton-specific guidelines. Our protocols have always been heavily weighted toward brain tumors. We are hopeful that in the next generation of studies, there will be an increase in the number of solid tumor patients. In this final slide, I'd like to mention why our treatment fails children. Radiotherapy, including proton therapy, fails when it's unable to control disease within the prescribed treatment volume or irreversibly injures the patient. Beyond inherent radio resistance, there are several points to consider when planning and treating pediatric patients. The first point is to obtain timely and proper imaging prior to treatment planning to evaluate for residual tumor and metastatic disease. The second point is to refer patient for additional surgery when it's appropriate and prior to radiation therapy and to avoid rushing into treatment. The third point is to take great care when treatment planning and using all available information. MR imaging with the patient in the treatment position, for example, can be a lifesaver. And finally, cutting corners on targeting a dose because of fear of side effects can have great consequences. In summary, the use of proton therapy in pediatric oncology continues to evolve with increased focus on treatment regimens that tailor treatment according to clinical pathologic factors. Disease control and functional outcomes are well understood securing the role of proton therapy as an effective means to achieve tumor control when corrected for potential acute and long-term effects. Current and future protocols are designed to answer questions about the role of proton therapy in children, 
with a variety of tumors. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tom. And there, there's the man himself, uh, from all the way from Memphis. So welcome. Thank you for that, Tom. That was fantastic. We've got a few, uh, we've got a few questions. And before we uh, go on to the questions, obviously, we're very sad that COVID prevented you from coming back to Melbourne. We were lucky enough to have Tom in Sydney and Melbourne, um, was it last year, for a short period of time. Um, and we we're all quite looking forward to having him back. So I've got a few questions here. So the first one is, which PRO measures are you using in the St. Jude Proton 1 trial? So in the, uh, the St. Jude Proton 1 trial is a phase four study. So it's very specifically looking at toxicity. And so we're using the uh, uh, CTCAE uh, version four and above uh, for that trial. And also a modification of that that's used by our St. Jude Life program. We don't have specific patient reported outcomes in the study because patients are also co-enrolled on therapeutic studies that include such uh, evaluations, for example, headache scales, uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, you know, other things like that, specific to the, the therapeutic study. Excellent, thank you. Uh, second question, obviously we've got a good, um, a good history of Australia uh, collaborating with with St Jude, particularly on St Jude Medullosteoma. I think there are three or four centres in the country that are, are part of that, that protocol, and certainly Peter Max has been part of that since uh, the late nineties. Um, with the South Australian machine opening in four years' time, and hopefully other machines opening up thereafter, would there be any enthusiasm for collaboration via TROG? So TROG is the Trans Tasman Radiation Oncology Group to co collaborate on some of your studies. Uh, absolutely. And as you know, Greg, and I'm glad that you mentioned it at the introduction, the uh, medulloblastoma trial, SJMB12, it's been open at a variety of centers, uh, Brisbane, uh, the Sydney sites, Melbourne, uh, and Perth. And so we love to collaborate with uh, the teams in your country and have done very well on that st study specifically. But we also know there are more. And uh, we had a strategic planning meeting today where we discussed the need to uh, increase collaborations. And we know that at least in Australia and in uh, New Zealand, uh, there'll be increased number of St. Jude protocols for other uh, diseases like leukemia, for example. But I think the, the key concept here is that uh, there's really strength in numbers. And because of the number of patients that we treat, these are rare tumors, and, and the numbers of patients that we treat are small, we have to get together uh, to treat an effective number of patients over a short period of time to see the true effects uh, of our treatment. So as, as you mentioned, the St. Jude, uh, latest St. Jude leukemia studies opened up, uh, it was being opened up in Melbourne at the moment. And obviously St. Jude Elliot, which is the recurrent medullosteoma uh, protocol is also open. So uh, that's where we're quite thrilled about that. Uh, another question, do we do you have MR access within the Proton facility or do, do they need to go um, outside of the, your department? Right, so I didn't show a slide um, of our treatment center, but our, uh, our department includes two MR systems, a 1.5T and a 3T system. I guess I should have included that into my talk, but I didn't want to talk about toys. I want to talk about uh, trials. But having MR in the department is really a uh, key. And you saw there that we have these umbrella protocols and the third one called St. Jude Mars, or originally it was St. Jude Proton 3, is to assess the need for imaging during treatment. Uh, proton therapy is very susceptible to changes in patient anatomy, uh, uh, changes in uh, target volume, size, and shape. And I'll give you a, a perfectly good example. So we had a a teenager with CNS germinoma who we had planned to start for uh, start craniospinal uh, treatment yesterday. And because she had been on steroids uh, during the uh, past week for some other problems, her body habit has changed. And we have to immediately scramble to develop a new treatment plan because what we had developed would be totally unacceptable. Uh, and so this is really one of the difficulties with children is often we're trying to get them on treatment in a short period of time. And when their changes um, and we're, we're, we're changes have to be made to the treatment plan at the last minute, it could potentially compromise care. 
And so we like to get ahead of that by imaging our patients uh, routinely. You know that we do this for craniopharyngioma. You know that we do this for low-grade glioma. Uh, we often do this for children with ependymoma who are soon after uh, posterior fossa surgery where there's some changes in the uh, in the, uh, the ventricle or brain shift. And so these are, we, we really believe this is an important part of radiotherapy planning and, and follow-up. Excellent. Um, another question from the crowd. Uh, could you comment on anesthetics for children, uh, the access in your, in your bunker and the, uh, the impact on overall treatment time? So really anesthesia, um, you know, the patient schedule is always the bottleneck and um, trying to get patients on treatment in a short period of time for our protocols, as I mentioned, but also making sure that we have the anesthesia resources that are necessary. You know, the treatment with proton therapy is not as quick as it is on a linear accelerator. The treatment times tend to be longer. Our craniospinal treatments are up to an hour. Um, and even older patients have a difficult time holding still for that long. And so having anesthesia capabilities is really critical to pediatric care. Um, and so we're, we have the luxury of having a dedicated anesthesia teams uh, for our department, and we're delivering anesthesia all day uh, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You know, a long time ago, Greg, you remember when you were at, here at St. Jude, uh, there was a lot of angst when we would have to treat a child in the afternoon uh, you know, that made us feel bad and they were NPO for a long period of time and all that. I mean, at, at this point, um, we're over that. We're just happy that we can deliver care and the families adapt to it and, and so do the children. It's not always easy, but uh, that's what we have to do. So we're delivering anesthesia all day long, uh, every day uh, to complete our schedule. So Tom, um, there was on the JCO paper that you, uh, you had in your slides showing the improvement in neurocognitive outcomes. Uh, that was from Texas Children's and um, the Sick, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Um, I noticed that they use the St. Judo 3 protocol with the one centimetre GTV to CTV margin. Do you think if that data was, or when that data is replicated on St. Jude 12, that the impact on protons will be greater or less given that the, uh, the margin has been reduced from uh, one centimetre to, to five millimetres? So I think, I think what's interesting, um, let's step back for a minute and talk about the ACNS 0331 trial. This was the medulloblastoma trial from COG where the whole, whole posterior fossa was treated in one group of children and the tumor bed with a 1.5 CM margin was treated in another. And it showed that uh, though the outcomes or the failure rate was equivalent comparing the large field versus the smaller field, right? Um, but when you look at the treatment plans, it's really difficult to determine who had full posterior fossa and who had tumor bed irradiation, because even on that trial that completed only a few years ago, a 1.5 CM margin was huge. Um, and if you have a large tumor bed, uh, all bets are off and you're treating a, a fairly large amount of brain. Now comes our current protocol, SJMB12, with a five millimeter margin surrounding the postoperative tumor bed. You know from your own experience that we're treating very, very focused volumes in medulloblastoma now. It's going to be quite a bit different than what was done in the past. So I think we're on our third generation of volume reduction trial for uh, older children with medulloblastoma. I think there's going to be a huge swing from the last trial to the current trial. The other part is that when we look at um, when we look at medulloblastoma, and there are different groups, right? There's the Wnt group, there's the sonic hedgehog group, and then the, the group three and four tumors. Those patients with group three and four tumors have, have often have tumors that are closer to the brainstem, um, whereas those with hedgehog tumors they're more lateralized and sometimes quite small. So there's going to be a difference in dosimetry to normal tissues, uh, as well as size of the tumor bed, even depending on the molecular subtype of tumor. Uh, you can only see this if you treat a large number of patients. And so I, th I, I look forward to reviewing this data with you uh, and what you've done at your center, what we've done at our center, and all the collaborative sites to add up what will be a, a, a huge study looking at target volume reduction in medulloblastoma. Um, 
Next week is the ISPNO meeting um, uh, in Japan, and, and I know many of people will attend that online. And when we talk about medulloblastoma at that meeting, you know, one of the things that you'll identify um, is there is a difference in in how those patients are targeted uh, for treatment, and I think we're going to see differences in outcome in the long term. Excellent. So um, we've got a question from uh, Jennifer Shard. What's your approach with vertebral dose and CSI and solid tumor, so neurobasoma? And in a similar note, I noticed on your your picture on the Wilms tumor that uh, you had homogeneous dose across the vertebral body, but not the uh, the spine and transverse processes, which is obviously something that um, we were all taught growing up to cover the whole lot. And I know when you were in Melbourne last year, we were discussing the fact that you, know, you feel that there's not much impact on, on bony growth on the on the spine and, and transverse processes. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are on that and, and how rigorous we need to be, particularly with protons, about covering vertebral bodies and bones for symmetry of growth. Well, these are all, um, these are all very important questions. You know, I had the one slide in my talk about uh, Wilms tumor and treating the retroperitoneum uh, using proton therapy instead of the flank, where you end up irradiating a substantial amount of uh, intra-abdominal uh, content. Um, proton therapy is also very nice for patients with bilateral Wilms tumor. And we started a case this week where we're using proton therapy, where in, on one side, the kidney was completely resected and we're treating the flank and on the opposite side, we're doing nephron sparing radiotherapy after a partial resection. So proton therapy makes those difficult cases uh, 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 quite easy. And again, the doses that we're using are so low, um, it's, it's difficult to measure the impact uh, on retrieval growth, even though these kids tend to be uh, very, very young. When it comes to medulloblastoma, I think we're still um, all over the place. You know, for example, I recently reviewed about 30 cases from one of the collaborative sites that uses uh, proton therapy, and there that are still using the PTV concept. So whereas in, uh, in our, at our center, we're using, the, we're targeting the CTV with a scenario-based margin that uh, uh, allows for uh, variations in setup uncertainty um, and range uncertainty. Uh, these other centers are still using a PTV concept and they're covering a PTV, which is that added margin beyond the CTV. And then there's obviously a halo of dose to ensure that the PTV is adequately covered. So for a given patient uh, at a different proton center in the US, when everything else is the same, how they're planned could result in completely different doses to normal tissues. Most centers are uh, treating the vertebral body, the whole vertebral body in medulloblastoma patients when they're pre-pubertal. Pre um, at our center, we tend to limit the dose to about 18 gray and then taper it back to that margin around the spinal canal. I really think there's a great opportunity here to spare more normal tissue in the vertebral body, but I think we have to do it prospectively. So this is something that we're about to work on and, uh, and try to add into our next uh, series of clinical trials. So to, to answer the question, we are still uh, delivering vertebral body dose for both low uh, average risk and high risk patients, but limiting it to about uh, somewhere between 18 and 20 gray uh, with we can, uh, when we can. And certainly that's what that's what we're we're trying to do with our VMAT plans for CSI is um, make sure the vertebral body is covered by a similar level, obviously with more exit dose. Uh, question from Jerry, where have we gotten to with heavy iron therapy in pediatric cancers? Well, I, Jerry, I don't think we're anywhere uh, yet with heavy ion therapy in pediatric cancers. As you probably know, the, the European centers that have uh, carbon ion therapy available. Uh, we're not using that, that modality in children. Uh, the last time that I checked, and I know you have speakers uh, during your symposium uh, who are more familiar with that and might be able to answer that question. You know, uh, Greg and I have discussed this uh, before, and the concept of using uh, carbon ion therapy is intriguing, especially for those uh, tumors that have uh, lower rates of local tumor control. And then pediatric that would include the pelvic sarcomas and bone tumors. And I've always dreamed that 
uh, just like we sent out uh, protocol-based patients to proton centers uh, for protocol-based therapy when we did not have proton therapy ourselves, wouldn't it be nice to collaborate with a heavy ion center and send a selected group of patients uh, for that type of treatment? And I know that in um, your part of the world, uh, at least if you fly north, um, you could find some centers that have heavy ions. Maybe you need to send a cohort of children up there with specific tumors, treat them and evaluate them. So what, one thing I've noticed that uh, with getting comparison plans for protons and photons is that with the um, increasing technology of VMAT, that in fact the, the, the difference between some of the plans isn't as marked as it used to be with either 3D conformal or, or even uh, IMRT. And in fact, there, there are some situations where the, the photons are superior for, for selected organs uh, because we can sculpt the dice a bit more. Do you, um, do you envisage that there, we'd, we'd come to a point where you do a joint plan, so part proton, part photon to take advantages of, of both? Or do you, do you think that the proton... Uh, technology will catch up with with uh, fo current photon technology in the future. Well, I think with pencil beam scanning and the smaller beam profiles uh, that we have now, um, maybe that uh, short advantage of beam at uh, against passive scattering uh, cases that's that's uh, been lost. I I, I I I would have a hard time comparing the two. The thing I'm most concerned about is collateral dose. And even on this medulloblastoma trial, we collaborate with centers both in the US and outside that use VMAT for uh, uh, craniospinal irradiation. And there is substantial dose to the, the thorax and abdomen, no matter how you uh, plan it. And there are rare cases or rare events, but, but maybe I shouldn't say rare, maybe above rare cases where we do see cardiopulmonary effects and effects on intra-abdominal intra organs. And so we'd like to keep that dose low. Another uh, thing that we're working on these days has to do with uh, hypogonadism and infertility. And then the question is, what is the contribution of radiation therapy? We know that gonadotoxic uh, chemotherapy is really the, uh, the prevailing issue uh, in at least these medulloblastoma patients, but there is, there is still some dose effect there. And so I think limiting the dose, uh, uh, the collateral dose as much as possible is, is, uh, is a real winner uh, when it comes to uh, proton therapy. Another aspect would be cataract formation. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, dose to the thyroid, thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Um, maybe we won't win uh, when it comes to looking at uh, hormone deficiencies or cognitive effects in certain children. But when it comes to some of these more limited toxicities, cataract formation, thyroid problems, and so forth, um, that collateral dose is really going to have a uh, huge meaning. So just so in the last few minutes, uh, we're, we're running nicely on, on time. Uh, I think anyone who's been to St. Jude has been incredibly impressed by the the, the big picture, uh, and not just the technology and the, the new drugs, but it, the, the whole aspect of the, your child life specialist, the, the fact that uh, whole families are looked after, um, and, and including in that is the, the full neuropsych uh, assessment and things like that. What, what do you feel are the standout programs at St Jude in terms of family support and um, patient support outside of the medicine and outside of the radiation that, that we could all aspire to, to do? Well, I think the, the key aspect is the time that you spend with your patients. Um, and so I feel like we have the luxury of time. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how you or others, you know, practice on a day-to-day -day basis. I know you take time with your patients and that, that that's very important. But I think at least here in the U.S., we have the time to spend with the families um, and we can envelop them in a, a, an environment where everything is done under one roof. And that's very helpful. Um, you know, in pediatrics, what I like about pediatrics is that the team is always ready to rally around the patient and do whatever it takes uh, to get them the things that they need. And again, this example of a patient with CNS germinoma who uh, we have to do, want to do a rapid replant on and get them 
uh, started as soon as possible. The whole team is working even right now uh, to make that happen. So th that's the pediatric environment. Uh, that's why we like practicing here. And we appreciate the time that our practice and institution uh, allows us to have with our patients. So yeah, I'd certainly recommend anyone uh, from the paediatric realm who finds themselves in the States to, to go and visit. I haven't been to St. Jude for way too long and I'm looking forward to getting back there. Uh, looks like we've got no more questions. So I'd just like to finish up by saying thank you very much for this. I'm again, very sorry we couldn't manage to get you uh, out to Melbourne, but hopefully we will get you out at some stage. Uh, I'm certain that um, Heen and his team in, in South Australia will be very keen to, to have you visit them when they're open in a few years time. Uh, so we'll get you to swing by Melbourne on the on the way through. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. It's been terrific. Thank you, and uh, best to your family. <laughs> and to yours. <laughs> All right. So uh, time for our second speaker. We're running two minutes ahead, which is really unusual for conferences. So uh, that's terrific. I, I hope you all um, got a lot out of that uh, that presentation. Um, our next talk is by Professor Martin Ishman. Martin's the VCCC Professor and Head of Cancer Health Research, sorry, Health Services Research in the University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research and Centre for Health Policy. Um, try saying that very quickly. Um, Martin will talk to us today about the principles of cancer registry, how to best manage real life data. So uh, welcome, Martin. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for the invitation to, to speak today and for the kind introductions. Um, uh, it was great to, to listen to the discussion about proton beam therapy just in the previous uh, talk, so thanks for that as well. Um, so what I wanted to do to is really to go uh, through some of the high level uh, issues in, in trying to get access to real world data and the use of real world data to inform precision oncology in a, in a wider perspective. I think most of the focus of my talk this morning is really about pharmaceuticals, the medicines and in the, in the, in the medical oncology space, but there is some relation to radiotherapy specifically, so I'll touch upon that as well. Um, so my, my, my starting point really is, is about the, uh, the access and listing of new therapies, new cancer treatments in, in the Australian health system. So basically from, from the PBS perspective or MBS perspective, uh, listing of new new treatments that that includes pharmaceuticals, new cancer drugs, but particularly also new ray therapy like the proton beam, um, and there's there's all kinds of uncertainties in in that position to list new treatments on on the uh, on the Medicare uh, schedules, and uh, that's where we actually use some of the real world data to inform that decision to reduce the uncertainty. So just a few few examples of where we use real world data. So this is this is a typical example of where we use randomized clinical trials to provide the evidence to make that decision for listing to the PBS of MBS. But as you know, most of the clinical trials are usually very relatively short follow up. We would try to extrapolate. We want to extrapolate survival benefit for a much longer time that that was included in the follow up of the trial. So. For, for listing decisions, we have to extrapolate survival beyond the trial duration. So there's all kinds of sophisticated models to do that, statistical models, and you can see that here on this, this particular figure, uh, where we use different uh, estimates to, to extrapolate survival. But you can also see there's significant uncertainty and heterogeneity in which models you use. So actually all those models produce different outcomes. This is an increasingly a problem with, with curative treatments, immunotherapy, and, and one of the reasons for, for using real world data. So can we use real world data? Can we link clinical registries to provide a much better estimate of survival outcomes based on randomized controlled trial evidence? So that's one way of using real world data. The, the other, uh, and that probably resonates with the proton beam uh, pretty, pretty much, is it's incomplete evidence. We see many more submissions coming to for listing that have either incomplete uh, evidence or uh, or that we have uncertainty about clinical evidence in, in making that decision to list those treatments. And uh, what we see, this is a paper from the BMJ Open, uh, that at least 10 to 15% of the trials or the submissions to FDA and EMA is based on a single arm trial. So no, no longer randomized controlled trials, but single arm trials. So in those cases, we can use real world data to match or to, to build a synthetic control arm to match that to the treatment arms. 
So that's one way, uh, another way to, to use the, the real data to actually con control for uh, for uh, effects that were not in, in part of the control, in the almost control trial. And then the final, I think that's the, the main uh, work that we currently do in, in our group, is to actually evaluate the use real data to evaluate actual use in the real world. So based, as, as you all know, clinical trials are are, um, are limited in terms of how to extrapolate to the real world. So we, we systematically collect real world data to actually see which patients are being treated, uh, when are they being treated, uh, are there any inequalities in access to care or inequalities in, in outcomes. That's what we can we can map through uh, the use of clinical registries and real world outcomes. And very specific piece of work is on treatment sequencing, like like you see here on the on the on the, on the figure for prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, where we, we can map the treatment sequences in a metastatic setting, and actually inform whether that's that's potentially uh, is related to survival outcomes. So just a very high level picture of the different rate, uh, registries and data sets that you might be able to use for uh, for this kind of work. And, and it's, it's interesting, you, see, you can distinguish the population level data sets here at the top. So national data sets uh, covering the whole of the nation. Uh, sorry, for instance, MBS, PBS data, uh, Medicare data, that's, that's all population level data at a very high level uh, covering the, the, the nation. On the other side, we've got this clinical registry, so hospital data sets. So there's quite a few clinical registries here uh, that we, we have access to for colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma, and lung cancer. The, the difference between the two, and that's where they, they all serve their own purpose, um, the difference between the two that the, the clinical data sets are usually much more granular. There's much more details there, clinical details that inform actual treatment decisions. But it's only limited to a few hospitals. Uh, whereas on the other side, the population level data sets really covering the whole nation, but it's, it's, it's less less coverage in terms of, of granularity uh, and, and treatment details. So it's usually administrative data sets that we can, we can access at the population level. They don't give a lot of information about actual treatment patterns and, and uh, patient information uh, about specific uh, subgroups or specific diagnostic tests that were considered in those patients. But anyway, both of them have, have their purpose. So if you wanted to inform health policy at the national level, you probably would go for a national data set, a population level data set, and assume this is going to be incomplete in terms of the clinical data. Uh, but for some of the work that we do on improving access, improving precision oncology, informing a treatment decision, we probably use clinical data sets. And I will show you a few of those. So one of the, the studies that we've done, this is really a population level data set to, to map time to treatment for non-small lung cancer patients. So there's different stages uh, in the referral from from prime from the first symptom to primary care to to uh, start of treatment. So we can map those intervals uh, here, and and some of them are referred to as diagnostic delay. So they refer to to the delay in getting starting the treatment. So from the from the diagnosis, the diagnosis, we can start a treatment. So we can map the treatment delays between the, the diagnosis date and the treatment date, and that's that's available from a population level data set. And that gives you very, very nice information. So to, to be honest, this is the, the, the Dutch data, so because we have a very nice population level data set from, from, uh, from the Netherlands, where we can actually map and compare uh, hospitals. This is from 79 hospitals, actually all the hospitals in the Netherlands, where we can map the treatments delay, so the, the, the delay from the, the diagnosis, the data diagnosis, and the, the start of the treatment. And you see the, the variation here with, with on, on average, a 40 day difference between the, the best performing hospitals and the worst performing hospitals. So the, the question obviously is, is that clinically meaningful? What's the, what does it mean in 40 days in terms of patient outcomes? But at, at least you, could, you can conclude there's, there's significant variation in the start of the treatment from, uh, from the, the time diagnosis. You can also map those, those hospitals in terms of overperforming or underperforming, so you, above the average, which is on the other side here, the other picture. So hospitals performing above the average and below the average. So there might be all kinds of reasons that underlie those differences. 
it probably gets more interesting if you look into the consequence. Is there a relation between the delay and the start of the treatment? So we can also get this population level data for the first, what's the first line treatment that was provided to, to those patients upon referral. And we can, we can map those uh, as, again against the delay. So this is the four first line treatments that are considered in this patient cohort, chemotherapy, chemoradiotherapy, radiotherapy, and targeted treatments. And, and all those, those four options have different patterns in terms of delays. For radiotherapy, the, the planning probably takes an additional a few days in terms of the, the delay. But we can say the same for targeted treatments with uh, usually panel testing or more molecular, sort of advanced molecular testing. And there could also be some sort of delays between referral from one hospital to the other hospitals. So you, you might map the, the treatment delays to specific treatments that were provided in the first line as an, an explanation of those delays. Again, this is an example of a population level data set comparing access to care. The, the other thing I wanted to share, this is more a clinical registry. So we've, we've done some work on colorectal cancer using the, the TREC registry, um, which, which is available through Biogrid. And the TREC registry gives about 3,000 patients, uh, metastatic colorectal cancer patients where we can map the treatment sequences. So this is the first line treatment. So you see the numbers here uh, of patients receiving the first line, second line, and the third line treatment. And um, so some, some, some oncology I, I, I talked to, I was surprised with the, the low number of patients receiving a third line treatment. So that, that creates a discussion whether you can start with the best treatment line first or the best treatment first and not wait until the third line, because there's only a, a fraction of patients receiving a, a third line treatment at all in metastatic disease here. But anyway, this is the three lines of treatment with the numbers, and you can see the complexity and the different pathway, the different sequences, and that's that's available on the on the simulation on the, on the right of your screen, where you can see that, that individual sequences or, or the, the different treatment sequences that we can identify are only used in, in a fraction of the patients. One or two percent of the patients receive a similar treatment sequence. So this is, there's significant variation here, heterogeneity. So this is, a, this is a nice way of visualizing that data. The, 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 the real question that we want to address here is what is the best way to, to move forward? What's the best, is there a best treatment sequence? Is there a best first line treatment that we can identify? So we're using this kind of real world data to identify what the best first line treatment could be for, for patients in metastatic disease. I'm not going to talk about the details here, but that's kind of use of that data. So be, before we get there, um, there's there's quite a bit of work to be done. I mean, we've, we've got this, this uh, large data sets, and, and it, to be honest, it's easier to work with the clinical registry because they, they usually contain much more details, clinical details, to, to map those the treatment pathways. But if you would be using the administrative data set and you have to identify the different events and the different lines of treatment. So that's what we do here. We, we, we built a timeline for, for the treatments with, uh, with a, a T0 start of the diagnosis date. We have to map the different events along the care pathway, the, the first event surgery, uh, event radiotherapy, and event chemotherapy and trial. So there's all kinds of events that might happen throughout the episode of care for that individual patient. So those events have to be mapped using those data sets. And, and that's pretty hard for, for an administrative data set, which, which just has very high level data. So we usually use those, those data sets. We have to infer those events from an administrative data set um, in, in all, all kinds of ways. For instance, the identification of an immunotherapy related toxicity is inferred from a diagnostic test there's no specific data on that immunotherapy-related toxicity, but we have to infer that event from another uh, um, uh, metric in, in a registry. But building those visuals, that's kind of critical for mapping the treatment pathways and identifying what the unique contribution will be of a specific uh, treatment, uh, treatment in, in the pathway. So we can identify patients receiving radiotherapy from, from this particular pathway and can evaluate if those patients do better than other patients. So that's that's done in, in non-small cell lung cancer. Again, this is a clinical registry that we work with uh, ben, uh, uh, ben Solomon, Moniz, and David Ball in at Peter Mac uh, with their uh, Aurora registry, where Fanny has built those visuals for 
for the for patients throughout their care pathway. And we, in this case, this is a case where we compare smoking to non-smokers, uh, where we can map the treatments. So the first line, second line, and third line treatment with with a proportion of patients receiving radiotherapy, palliative uh, radiotherapy, uh, chemotherapy. That's another uh, a, a, a fraction of patients receiving that in the first line, and then move to second line. And we can do the same for this non-smoker population. So uh, obviously, and that's that's known from the literature that the treatment opportunities in, in non-smokers with targeted treatments are, are much better than in the non-smokers, which, which usually is, are receiving chemotherapy alone. But there's much more uh, targeted treatments available for the, the non-smoker because of the actionable mutations. So these are the two groups that we can we can look into the, the, the treatment pathways, and then we can map survival. So we can we can look into uh, survival differences between smokers and non-smokers based on the treatment sequences, based on the treatments they provided. Uh, but obviously, this is confounded by by the smoking status as well. We can also look into the numbers of treatments that are are provided to those patients, between uh, comparing smokers and non-smokers, first line, second line, third line treatment. And you see there's much more treatment opportunities in the in the non-smoker population for targeted treatments of, of 60% of patients receiving a third line uh, and even to the fifth line, 23% of patients receiving a fifth line of treatment compared to only 6% of the smoker population basically receive only chemotherapy and uh, immunotherapy. So this is, where, this is another example of using a clinical registry, a detailed clinical registry to map care pathways and to identify whether some subgroups of patients do better than other, other groups of patients. We, we can also use that kind of registries to inform whether new, what the impact will be of new cancer treatments. And that's part of the, of the work that we, we do in PrimCAD, that's an MRFF funded project uh, through, based on a call from, from uh, the Department of Health in Canberra, in Canberra about uncertainty of the number of patients that, that might benefit from new ca cancer treatments on the horizon. And as you can imagine, if you if you don't know the numbers of patients that receive that treatment or might likely receive the treatment, it's very hard to estimate the budget impact of listing that specific treatment. So the underlying idea here is whether we could predict whether new how many patients will be eligible for new treatments on the horizon and what the potential budget impact of that treatment listing will be for the Commonwealth in Australia. This is another example where we use those clinical registries to map pathways and to identify the numbers of patients receiving first, second, and third line treatment. So this is also similar clinical registries. We've seen the, the lung cancer registry already. There's another one, the melanoma registry, mainly focusing on stage one, two, two, and three A disease, and the colorectal cancer registry that were part of the PrimCAD project. And we can map the numbers of patients receiving first, second, and third line treatment. So you see the differences here, first and second and, and third line treatment. So now we know the numbers. The question is in, in the print case, if we're going to list a new treatment, how what would be the impact of the budget impact of that new listing to, to the Commonwealth? So in, in that case, and this is a kind of a modeling uh, approach that we take within that project. Uh, based on the real world data from those registries. So suppose this is a, this is a lung cancer population uh, with, with the mutations present in those with a with, uh, uh, significant number of, of GHFR, ALGA, and KRS mutations with, with uh, eligible for targeted treatments. So we take the uh, targeted treatments here, and we, we, this is a typical pathway for a, a patient with an ALGA mutation. So conventional hypocalcinib or sumetinib, that's the three lines that we might think of. And we, ex we, we can estimate the number of patients receiving those treatments. We, we can estimate the numbers of patients receiving those treatments, and then we can estimate the budget impact. So that's, that's what we can do uh, to inform that listing in, in, in the PBS. But now it gets excited because um, this, is, this is changing. This is not static at all. This is all based on historical data. So we, we know the treatment lines from the registry, which is also, this is based on, on the, the past four years, but this will change. So we will see that some of those treatments will be used up front. So osimetinib will be used in the first line rather than the third line. So there's all changes here. So we have to think about what would be the impact of the number of patients receiving osimetinib in the first line, if it's gonna be available as a first line treatment. So that's gonna be a, a very uh, in, in ch interesting challenge for, for this kind of work. 
And also, if, if you look at the FDA uh, listings at the moment, if you go to lung cancer, in, just in the month of May this year, there were seven new listings at the FDA or approvals in the, in, in the FDA specifically for the lung cancer population. So if we, we do horizon scanning, so we can actually identify those treatments and try to estimate where, where will they be used and what might be the impact of those treatments on for the Commonwealth in Australia. And I said, this is, this is very much in the pharmaceutical space. And I'm, I'm perfectly aware that this is not, not your key interest, but I think this is very, very similar to, to work that, that we'll do in, in the radiotherapy space as well. Okay, I'd like to, to wrap up with the final two slides. Um, so what are the high level experiences that we, we have with, with using this clinical registries? And, and I said, there's population level data sets, there's, there's uh, clinical registries, and uh, there's a couple of learning points if you if you're thinking of using those data sets or registries to uh, to evaluate to to map to use radiotherapy services to try to e evaluate the effects of, of for instance proton beam in a real world uh, based on the conditional listing conditional approval. So the um, the, the first uh, learning point for me was this, that that the, the most clinical registries are very detailed. They capture clinical endpoints, treatment information. But most of them, they lack information that, that might be relevant, not so much for clinical decisions, but at least for, for listing and for health services research. For instance, patient reported outcomes, quality of life is usually not incorporated in, in those registries. So that might be a very easy fix. If you're setting up a registry, please do include a patient report outcome like an e ERTC questionnaire or a quality of life questionnaire. The, there's also very hard to get reliable data as about stage uh, stage of disease, stage of diagnosis, and information about progression. We usually have to infer that from from the registries. There's no no specific data here, data points, entries that will inform us about stage of, of disease and and progression. And also very important for in, in particular immunotherapy, but also for for radiotherapy uh, adverse events. Monitoring of adverse events, um, uh, monitor, uh, recording of adverse events in those registries. There's, there's some some missing data here, so we have to infer that from from the registry. But also uh, uh, diagnostic information, imaging, um, molecular pathology. So that's usually not part of a clinical registry, but we we can work with that. So we, we there's there's ways we can deal with that by linkage. So that's where we we link different data sets, and that's that's probably easy. Is if, if it's within the institution, so if there's internal data set within the same hospital, we can link the clinical data to the administrative data, with it, which is held within the hospital, because the, the administrative data would allow us to map episodes of care. We can see the whole pathway of that patient. And on top of that, we can, we can use the clinical data to get the, the clinical details here. So that's, that's what we can do internally with linkage. We can also link to pathology and pharmacy dispensing data, and we can link to EHR and, and electronic health records or health, electronic medical records give, give much more granularity in, in terms of patient management. But they, they don't, probably don't replace the clinical registry. So some people think we can, do the, we can use the EMR for all kinds of research purposes. Uh, I do think in the future, we will end up with very sophisticated clinical registries designed for a specific purpose. And we can, on top of that, we can use the EMR again to map uh, care episodes. But the EMR is not going to replace everything uh, for, for us. So that's the internal, the hospital-based data, so it's linkage. The other thing we can do, and that's another a very important learning point, we can link, link to external data sources, like, like primary care data, or to PBS and MBS item numbers. So if you want to do a complete care pathway to identify all treatments received, you want to link it to a population level data set that gives information about the pharmaceutical access. So that needs you to link it to the PBS or MBS. And this, if, if you design a clinical registry, by far the most efficient, a really strong recommendation would be to build in an informed consent procedure. So patients give their consent for their data to be linked to PBS, MBS, because then it's relatively easy to get the data from the, from the Commonwealth. If you don't build in that informed consent from patients to be linked to PBS and MBS, it's going to be a, it's a, a huge challenge to get that data, and they won't share that data with you. So that's that's a very important learning point, for, at least for me, and it might be helpful for you too. And and of course, we can link to other data sets, cancer registry, very important primary care data sets, 
And that's that's kind of the work that we currently do with, within the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Center to build a linked data platform, not only to map care pathways within the hospital, but also link it to primary care data sets. So we can we can identify patients, we can look into complete episodes of care from primary care, from referral, we can look at diagnostic delays, we can look into the first diagnosis, diagnosis date, and, and so on. And we can even do that for, for metropolitan areas uh, compared to rural uh, areas. So we can potentially link uh, primary care data, we can link it to hospital data, we can link it to clinical data. So that's the larger uh, plan that we're, we're developing. We're pretty much on, on track here and working on, on the next phase of the plan of the linked data platform. So at the moment, we've got 2.5 million unique patients identified and linked in, in the registry. That's mainly primary care data that we link to hospital data, administrative data, and we also link it to clinical data and the cancer registry. That we, that's where we are at the moment. And we have currently, we're, we're developing plans to also link it back to the Victoria Radiotherapy minimum data sets. So to also identify access to care in, in the radiotherapy space specifically. Um, so we've got an enduring linkage. Uh, we've got ethics approval to, to build that linked data set. We've all the governance in place for you to re re request data through the BioGrid platform. And at the moment, we, we do have some work. We have, have several projects using this linked data platform uh, in, in correlative cancer, for instance, to study disparities and outcomes following primary uh, treatment. So we, we look into the hospital treatments and we map patients all the way to primary care, uh, if there's any disparities in outcome, if there's differences in resource utilization following primary treatment in, in the hospital. We do the same for the lung cancer cohorts to evaluate diagnostic delays and impact on survival. And as I said, we're working on a new program for the VTPC 2024 um, on value-based care, which actually is built on the data linkage platform that we've, we've started with uh, four years ago. And I think that's that's where what, what I wanted to say this morning. Thank you very much for for your attention and for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Martin. That was uh, really eye-opening, and I, I look forward to using that sort of uh, information to assess benefits of protons when when South Australia opens up, and in particular comparing patients who've had delays due to uh, referring for protons uh, with mTOP the local and, and uh, to standard radiotherapy. Uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so we might have to hold up, uh, hold any questions over, but um, feel free to put any questions up on the private chat and we, we can get to them. So thank you very much, Martin, that was terrific. Uh, our next guest is um, Alicia Moore. Alicia's the Radiation Therapy Manager at TROG. Uh, Cancer Research is joining us to present on a similar um, topic on the Australian da Data Partnerships. Uh, post your questions and if we've got time at the end, we will uh, answer them. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, as Greg introduced, I'm the, I look after the Radiation Therapy Quality Assurance Team at TROG Cancer Research, and I'm going to be talking today about the TROG Accelerate project, um, which is accelerating cancer therapy research via a national collated data asset. So the TROG Accelerate project is all about leveraging data from retrospective clinical trials establishing a better framework for how we collate and store future trial data, as well as thinking about new and complex technology registries. How can we collect this data and maximize its utility to support future research and improve patient outcomes? Um, <clears throat> so a bit of background about how this framework came to light. Um, in 2018, Verity Ahern led an MRFF grant for a particle therapy registry hosted through TROG. Unfortunately, the application was unsuccessful. However, it remained a really important priority for this group and for TROG. Um, and within this time, the TROG MRNRT and TROG Particle Therapy Special Interest Groups formed as well. And very early on, the MRNRT Special Interest Group flagged the need for an MR Linux registry, very much led by Paul Keel and Sarah Elliott. So both concepts were looking to leverage the technology itself and gather evidence from the outset of implementation and collaborate with TROG, so immediate commonality. Likewise, Lois Holloway had been doing a lot of work in the space of distributed learning and the OSCAT project. Lois put in an ARDC application for the platforms round um, and has in fact been successful. 
So TROG collaborated on this proposal um, and I'm pleased to say that the concept of an OSCAT node at TROG is closer to becoming a reality. Um, and then of course, secondary analysis of TROG trial data remains an important strategic goal for TROG. Um, and as part of the secondary data analysis committee um, led by Martin Ebert, we're looking at what infrastructure does TROG need to efficiently and effectively facilitate secondary analysis as presently there are a lot of gaps in how we do this. So Martin led the development of a data archive discussion paper, which outlined what TROG needs for high quality and effective secondary analysis and the potential options that could be adopted. So all of these projects had a great deal of commonality and crossover in terms of infrastructure needs and aims. So we considered more broadly how to leverage TROG's existing data asset and infrastructure so data from TROG trials and our, our databases and pivot this towards establishing a national data partnership for advanced radiotherapy. So including, but not limited to obviously particle therapy, MR LINAC, cyber knife, gamma knife, um, and I'm sure the list will go on as technology evolves. So it's really capitalizing on a common goal of establishing new technology registries um, and key infrastructure for secondary analysis. So this is how the project uh, came to fruition. It was a joint collaboration to collect and utilize valuable data essentially. So broadly seeking to leverage what we have, capitalize on the common goals and look to what we want and need for the future. We need usable, findable, accessible data to essentially change practice. So first let's consider the data that we have. Utilisation um, of data that we have collected from TROG clinical trials makes sense. We have a rich resource that could be used to answer new questions. It has the potential to be cost effective and immediate resource. Clinical trials are expensive, so there's opportunity to get access to high quality data that's already been collected and curated. So this makes perfect sense. We can pull data, look across different cohorts, identify trends and find new perspectives. We have over 6,000 imaging and radiotherapy planning data sets from 14,700 participants over 31 years. So all of this sounds fantastic, but um, there's obviously a bit of a catch. Over this time, you know, a lot has changed, technology, formats, where the data is held, cost and funding. So we need to address these issues to make sure that this important and valuable data resource is centralised, standardised and accessible. And this is a big task. So the current data pipeline looks like this. We get a trial, we collect a defined set of data, which includes a combination of source data, imaging, radiotherapy plans, reports, patient report outcomes, and um, CRF data. And depending on who the central trial coordinator is, um, whether or not there is RTQA, and if it is done by TROG, as well as who the trial sponsor is, has a big bearing on where the data ends up. So we'll, what we're looking at is, is how to ensure that the TROG framework is set up so that all of the data from TROG trials can go into a central warehouse where the data is, again, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, the FAIR principle. So it's not just about legacy data that we have from clinical trials and prospective clinical trial data that we need to think about. We know clinical trials are expensive, and even though an important clinical question should be answered, the likelihood of being funded can be extremely low. Um, as a result, in recent times, we've had quite a few projects exploring um, utilisation of a registry framework. Likewise, radiotherapy is very much a technology-driven field, and there is great desire to collect information on treatment modalities, techniques, and technology from the outset of implementation and weigh up on their benefits. Expensive, specialised specialized equipment is needed for particle therapy, MR, LINAC, SRS. So how do we justify their costs to government, to cancer care facilities? Um, they need to weigh up the cost benefit ratio. So there's a strong feeling again that registries could form the solution here, but a registry will also not work long term, long term if the costs are too high, both money and in people. So we need to think about automation, bridging ethical jurisdiction barriers, reduced handling of data at the site and at TROG. Um, broadly, it's the accessibility, usability and the government governance framework um, solution. It needs to be sustainable. 
Uh, so here it is. Um, this is the framework that we're proposing to address the needs of um, registries, as well as the specifically pivoted technology-driven registries, as well as legacy and prospective clinical trials data. So I'd just like to acknowledge Martin Ebert um, for his great contribution in developing up this image. Um, but here you can see uh, an overview of the data sources, the repository, the data access points and the potential outputs. In essence, all the data from TROG clinical trials and these new registries for specialised RT, te RT technologies will be collected and warehoused at TROG. The new framework aims to catalogue and make this data, again, the FAIR principle, interoperable, findable, accessible and reusable. So that our members can access the data um, as well as the wider research community and conduct analyses, research and inform things like cost effectiveness, outcomes and inform policy and treatment decisions. We very much see this as the future framework that we need and, and this is what we're going to continue to work towards. So where will the data come from? Of course, as I mentioned, we want to maximise the utility of TROG legacy data um, and ensure prospective future clinical trial data is set up accordingly. Expensive specialised radiotherapy technology is constantly changing and evolving. So ideally we need an interoperable framework that can be easily applied to different technologies. We need a way to efficiently, quickly and cost effectively pivot to collect this data. The data will include clinical data, imaging, health economics, patient reported outcomes, diagnostic information, demographics um, and technology specific data. So big question number one, how are we going to get the data? Um, for the legacy data from the last 30 plus years, this needs to be curated, reformatted and centralised. Some, not all, of the historic data is still held outside of TROG, so we're actively working to centralise this. Future TROG trials and registries, um, we're considering both virtual and centralised repository frameworks. For the virtual, we'll be looking to leverage OSCAT using the distributed learning approach um, and have a node set up at TROG. As I mentioned, the AIDC platforms grant led by Lois Holloway was successful. So this is gonna be um, a significant feather in our cap to progress this forward. In addition, we want the option for a centralized repository also including source data and minimum data fields it needs to be easily customizable, cost-effective with mechanisms for data deposit and analysis. Big question two, three and four, um, how do we know what we want? What are we going to do with the data and how are we going to bring this very big vision to life? So with any great project, uh, we need a great project plan and excellent collaboration. Um, so step one will be to clearly define what's needed. Um, what are the minimum data fields, data standards, formats, metadata and warehouse structure? Step two will include more about functionality. What do we need in terms of interactions and interfaces, data upload, report forms, tracking, reporting? Um, and as we look at step one and two, we need to be considering what do we already have in terms of data deposit workflows, current platforms and tools and the gaps. Um, and obviously we have a lot of experience in this area, but where, you know, where we can, we need to leverage um, the current TROG infrastructure. So we also need um, a process for publishing the registry descriptive and summary metadata, um, ideally to the TROG website. And of course we need governance, appropriate policies, security, access and control and integration into TROG processes. Um, again, we have a fair bit of experience in this, but it'll be about bringing it all together. So all of this will be underpinned by collaboration, ensuring international and national compatibility and involvement of key stakeholders you know, registries, as we heard from the previous talk, are not new. So we need to leverage expertise and knowledge um, that's already there. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So after the definition stage, it's obviously all about actually building and implementing what we need um, so that it's scalable, adaptive um, and integrated. So this is it. Uh, you see, you can see in pink and light blue are the key areas that we need to develop up. Um, red is what we need to leverage and is what we already have. And blue is obviously the rich inputs and outputs of the framework.
So it's it's a big job, um, but you know, is really where we see the vision. So of course it comes down to a big question. Of course, money is key. And it's a big, big project. So we applied through, through the Australian Research and Data Commons Data Partnerships Grant. As I mentioned, Lois was successful through the, the platforms round, which was a separate category um, to which we applied for. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in the September application. Um, so we then looked, started to look for other opportunities. So at the end of last week, we put in a grant for the Perpetual Impact Grant round. Um, and funding would commence in 2021. And this is up to only $120,000. It's not a huge amount. However, we're hoping to leverage um, some in-kind support as well to facilitate the project. Um, and because it is only 120,000, we need to break down the bigger TROG Accelerate framework and think about scalable chunks. So for the perpetual grant, we focused on the registries framework, starting with particle therapy. So if successful, this will set up the base framework to underpin future technology registries and help define the warehouse and infrastructure requirements for secondary analysis and future prospective clinical trials. Because obviously MR LINAC as well is here um, and we wanna be pivoting to collect that data as soon as we possibly can. So in summary, uh, the TROG Accelerate framework is where we see the future. Um, we'll continue to seek funding. We need a data asset that again um, adheres to the FAIR principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. We need solutions that are long term and sustainable. We need to be able to leverage new technology. Um, so it's all about timely data collection uh, to help us inform decision making. And I can't stress enough the key of collaboration. You know, everything we do we want to make sure that we're efficient in doing so, capitalising on the expertise of others um, and, and leveraging where we can. So a huge big thank you. Um, and these were the contributions through the AIDC uh, data partnerships application. Um, it was a massive collaborative effort. And, you know, I can't thank all of these people enough for their, their enthusiasm, their collaboration. Um, and hopefully we're successful through the perpetual grant, but we're going to keep on working towards um, getting the money to make this vision a reality. Thanks very much. Thanks, Alicia. That was amazing and what an incredible body of work uh, you've, you've presented there. And I'm, I'm sure the proof will be in the pudding in a few years' time when we can, uh, when we can mine it. Uh, again, we are a little short on time, so we might hold off questions for afterwards. And don't forget, everyone, we've got the, the chat rooms that uh, we can ask questions in uh, or you can just stretch your legs during the coffee break. Uh, before that much needed coffee break, because it's been a very big and important session this morning, we've got one more speaker and that's Professor Trevor Leong. Uh, Trevor is the Scientific uh, Committee Chair at TROG and uh, up until a couple of years ago was the de Professor Director at Peter Mac, so he's well known to everyone here. Um, so Trevor's going to talk about protons and clinical trials, has the horses bolted? Thank you Trevor, fire away. Thank you Greg. So I'd like to thank uh, the organising committee for inviting me to take part. My share screen's not working, so I'm going to be relying on the backstage people just to change my slides. Uh, the, the topic I've been asked to talk about is protons and clinical trials. As the horse bolted, the way I interpreted this was that protons are already accepted as the best thing since life spread. So why do we need clinical trials to demonstrate its superiority over existing treatments? Next slide. I'll just start with some background information, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Protons have been used to treat cancer since the 1950s, but the first hospital-based unit was not established until the 1990s. Now proton therapy is widely available across the developed world. I think there's about 109 particle therapy centers currently in operation, 12 of which have heavy iron facilities. Another 37 are under construction, including two in Singapore, two South Korea, one in Thailand and two in Taiwan, and a further 28 centres are at the planning stage, all of which are expected to be operational by 2025. In parallel to this, the number of patients treated with protons has also risen sharply over the last five years. 
The construction of proton therapy facilities, I think, reflects the views held by clinicians and also governments that this form of radiotherapy is potentially superior to existing treatments because it may offer significant quality of life advantages. Next slide. As we've already heard, there's only one centre approved for development in Australia, which is the Bragg Centre based in Adelaide, but there are also centres proposed for Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. Next slide. So what does the research landscape for proton therapy currently look like? If you have a look at the Particle Therapy Cooperative Group website, there are 334 studies listed, which range from simple data collection protocols right through to phase three clinical trials. The paediatric and difficult to treat cancers such as CNS in the head and neck, which proton therapy is usually considered particularly beneficial, are well, well represented, but so are some of the not so difficult cancers such as proton, uh, prostate cancers. Next slide. A quick search on clinicaltrials.gov shows a very similar number of proton studies with about 332 to 351, depending on the search items entered. So this includes trials that are not yet recruited, those that are active, and those that have also completed recruitment. If you drill down a little further, there are approximately 135 actively recruiting studies. And of these, only 15 are phase three clinical trials. There are approximately 70 completed proton studies. And of these, only a couple of them are phase three studies. In contrast, if you search radiotherapy trials, there are over 17,000, of which about 2,500 are phase three studies. So as you can see, the solid clinical evidence for proton therapy is sparse. Next slide. Coming back to the initial question, has the horse bolted? And do we need to do clinical trials in proton therapy? I think the answer is no and yes. The paucity of clinical evidence for proton therapy is due to several factors. Internationally, most proton units have only become operational in the last five to 10 years. Due to the limited capacity to meet clinical demand worldwide and the perception that proton therapy already provides superior treatment, research has not been a high priority. However, there are now sufficient proton units in academic centers across North America, Europe and Asia for stronger collaborative research efforts in proton therapy. Also, I think the scope of any government proposals for proton therapy in Australia would have to include a comprehensive research program. Next slide. There are other reasons why we should aim to develop a portfolio of clinical trials for all patients receiving proton treatment in Australia. It's well known that integrated clinical treatment and research improves the health outcomes of patients because the research findings can be quickly translated into clinical practice. This recent UK NHS study of the relationship between research activity and patient mortality showed that high levels of research activity were associated with reduced patient mortality. And while these improvements in, in mortality are related to the effective translation of research into clinical practice, I think they also reflect the way in which the access to best uh, treatment technologies can attract the best researchers and clinicians. Next slide. Why don't we just sit back and wait the results of ongoing international trials? This paper from COSA shows that the results from Australian-based clinical trials can be implemented, implemented more quickly than if Australian clinicians are dependent on trials conducted overseas. So in panel A it shows that the case in the case of overseas trials, improvements in Australian clinical practice will only commence once clinicians are aware of the results. This can take up to four to eight years. In contrast, Australian-based trials allow clinicians to participate throughout the research, providing them with early access to improved protocols and interventions, which can be implemented sooner. Next slide. The introduction of complex new technologies such as proton treatment also requires the implementation of standardized and audited protocols to optimize radiotherapy quality assurance. And this is best achieved in the context of clinical trials. So Lester Peters powerfully demonstrated the importance of quality radiotherapy in head and neck cancer. In the TROG0202 trial, he reported that poor radiotherapy resulted in a 20% decrement in two-year overall survival, regardless of the randomization arm. Next slide. A comprehensive proton research program can be grouped into three key areas. 
Firstly, innovation technology, and we've already heard a bit about this, including advances in particle accelerated physics, imaging, arc therapy, gantry design, etc. Secondly, molecular and radiobiology studies and through clinical research. And thirdly, clinical trials, which is the focus of this talk. Next slide. Because the capital and operational costs of proton therapy are much higher than that of conventional photon beam radiotherapy, it is prudent that the perceived benefits of proton therapy are demonstrated using scientifically robust clinical trial methodology. So some of the studies we could do, for example, are large phase three clinical trials comparing proton treatment to standard uh, photon-based treatment. These are, probably should be conducted in collaboration with international sites to achieve the large patient numbers that are required. In addition, other clinical trials could seek to improve the clinical effectiveness and also the understanding of the biophysical basis of proton treatment. Um, examples would include exploratory phase one and two trials, such as combined photon-proton treatments and fractionation studies. Also trials of combined modality research with systemic agents. And of course, there's a host of uh, health services research. So that is a result. Next uh, slide. Do we have the critical mass of patients in Australia to conduct meaningful clinical research in proton treatment? This figure was generated by uh, for the Victorian proton beam therapy project to model the range in Australian demand for proton treatment, taking into account the number of estimated patients with proton suited indications. In the high scenario, the demand estimate is approximately 1600 patients from Australia and New Zealand who would be suitable for proton treatment by the year 2023. And this increases to about two and a half thousand in 2039. In the low scenario, only about 300 patients from Australia and New Zealand would be suitable for proton therapy in 2023, rising to 365 in 2039. The patient numbers are therefore modest, and we need to take this into account when we develop new trial proposals. Next slide. It is clear that we need a nationally networked approach to the introduction of proton treatment in Australia. And this also applies to clinical research. There needs to be a very clear and consistent research framework to assess and build the, ev the evidence base. And this needs to be broad enough in its scope to accommodate all patients who are going to be treated with proton treatment in Australia. As the peak body for radiation oncology research in Australia, I think TROG will play a vital role in helping to build this research framework. We have an established 30 year track record in cancer research, with almost 15,000 patients recruited across over 100 clinical trials. TROG brings together all the relevant professional bodies, such as RANSCAR, the College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine, the Australian Society of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy as well as ANSTO in community groups. Next slide. TROG has been a leader in the evaluation and implementation of new health technologies in radiation oncology. The TROG ANRATAC project, which most of you will be aware of, was funded by the federal government to develop a research framework that would support the rapid production and appropriate, uh, of appropriate evidence on safety, cost effectiveness and effectiveness of new technology to allow its timely introduction in Australia. This framework was used previously to evaluate uh, IGRT and IMRT. Next slide. TROG has the necessary clinical trial infrastructure to develop and conduct clinical trials in proton treatment. The scientific, scientific committee structure is divided into subspecialty working parties based on tumor site. And as Alicia has indicated, we've recently formed a particle therapy special interest group. The remit of the New Techniques and Technologies Committee is to identify, prioritise and develop guidelines and RTQA procedures for new technology in clinical trials. TROG is a world leader in RTQA and we've already heard Alicia speak about data storage and review infrastructure. TROG, of course, has long-standing established links with many clinical trials groups, both nationally and internationally. Next slide. So what are the next steps? Well, I think first of all, you need, you need to establish the, the registry to provide the platform for clinical research. 
and with the intention that all patients in Australia will be entered into clinical trials, and we've already heard a lot about this. We need to build collaborations with international groups, but also with universities and medical research institutes. The Australian Synchrotron would also be a potential collaborator. It's got a demonstrated track record of excellence in radiation biology, imaging and particle beam physics. Government funding for research through schemes such as the NHMRC are finite. We therefore need to explore other programs of national research support. In Victoria, for example, the Australian Secretron has secured $510 million over 10 years through the National Innovation and Science Agenda. Industry partnerships will also provide opportunities for support for research. And lastly, I think we need to start developing Australian-led trial proposals. And I know work has already started uh, within the Particle Therapy Special Interest Group within TROG, and there's a very clear pathway for trial development within the uh, TROG uh, Scientific Committee. Uh, that was all I'm going to say. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Trevor. That was uh, that was really great, and, and nice to know that we've got a lot of research ahead of us uh, uh, when when Adelaide opens. Um, but I, but I think the collaboration is important, particularly if we can liaise with the international groups that we have, and clearly with what Tom was saying earlier on, he he's open to uh, collaboration with established pathways there. So that's exciting. Uh, it's 20 to 11. That gives us 20 minutes for a coffee break. So feel free to explore the. Um, the group chats on the left hand side of your screen. Look at the uh, I have to look at my, the sessions tab. Um, also, have a look at the exhibition to learn more about Peter Mac and what we've got to offer here. Or if you want, just get up, stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, and we will see you back here at 11. So, thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. I uh, would like to finish up by thanking all our speakers. I think it's been a really interesting and fascinating morning. Uh, so, uh, we will see you in 20 minutes.